All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're going to be starting in just a minute or so. As a reminder, please keep your mics muted during the presentation. If you'd like to ask any questions, just type them into the chat. We'll keep track of them and then we will do questions at the end. All right, so hi everybody, welcome. I'm Daisy, I'm here with the Seed Library. Um, we are asking for donations. So if anybody has any seeds to donate to us, we'll gladly take them. We have some a program coming up on July 8th for the Ren Day. We'll be giving away um, seeds and seed starting plants, um, seed, seed, seed starting planters uh, for people who are interested in starting a little Shakespeare herb garden. And I can share the details for that and give me just one moment. And that's July 8th, not next week, but the week after. I'll share that in the chat in just a minute. Um, but Judy, if you're ready, I can hand the mic over to you. Okay, thank you. Oh, I see some names that I know uh, popping up here in the audience. So I'm Judy Schmidt with the City of Dallas and the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And I'm um, the manager of the outreach and the engagement team for the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And it's always just a pleasure to partner with the Dallas Seed Library and also with the, the Dallas Library and all elements of it, because we do um, three different virtual programs. We do Earth Day Every Day, Grow With Us, and Earth Kids with the library. So it's been a lot of fun. This partnership started in 2020 and it's still going strong. So welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. This is such an honor to have this program and to be able to host it with Daisy and her team. And uh, Janet, you are, um, how shall I say? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, all in the news and the articles about you and all the different things, uh, uh, people at the Arboretum and, you know, the managers and horticulture managers have all said it best, you know, you just are really an expert um, about the plants and the soil. So it's so wonderful to be able to welcome you today. I know that in my yard right now, I'm so pleased that in this heat, I have so many things blooming and mostly because it's the Texas tough plants that I have. Um, I have yellow milkweed that's in bud and getting ready to bloom and I just can't wait. Um, and just all kinds of things. I'll let you talk about all that. But, you know, I'm here to mention to you that the Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability works on different aspects of the environment every day. Everything from air quality. Uh, when you see these ozone action days, we've been having quite a few of. Uh, that's because we have teams that go out and they're at the air monitors that are throughout Dallas already at three and four o'clock in the morning, gathering air samples and sending them into the state uh, so that we can you know, find out what's going on and what you all need to know if you're an at-risk uh, person who needs to know that there's an ozone action day coming up. So we do that, we work on storm water, we work on water conservation, which is so um, important when it comes to talking about pollinators, Texas drought plants, because we wanna make sure that we save every drop of water that we can, you know, all of us, but we still wanna have these beautiful landscapes um, these drought tolerant, you know, homes and landscapes, but we just need to be smart. So all these new behaviors that we can learn about or enhance our behaviors, and that's what Jan is going to do today, is teach us all about pollinators. So I understand she's an expert on our, our clay soil, on the plants, on the, the, uh, the, the plants that lure these wonderful insects in to our garden so that we can continue growing food. Uh, throughout our state and our, our area and all over the nation. But uh, she is a Texas Master Gardener. She has been a Master Gardener for nearly 20 years now and has earned multiple certifications and has received many accolades for her dedication to the program. Her specialties include, as we've been talking about, native and adaptive plants and attracting animals that are signs of a vibrant garden, such as the butterflies, the birds, and the bees. And with that, I'm going to hand it over 
to our very distinguished speaker, and we're honored to have you here, Ms. Janet Smith. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, and let me get my program up here, and we'll get started. Okay. Okay, good morning, everybody. It, uh, good afternoon. So today we're going to talk about plants for pollinators. And as mentioned, I'm a Dallas County Master Gardener, and our mission is to educate the public about good horticultural practices. And certainly what we're talking about today uh, falls into that category. Um, the main pollinators are bees. They probably do 95% of the pollinating. Butterflies are kind of mi minor uh, pollinators and hummingbirds the same, but they do have plants that they help to pollinate. The number one thing you need to remember is that you shouldn't use pesticides, insecticides in a pollinator garden because you're trying to attract insects, not prevent them from coming. And um, so just keep that in mind. I was sitting next to somebody at a master gardener meeting that said, oh, he just loved everything I talked about. And then at the end of the program, he asked the speaker who was speaking on bees. He said, he was having his um, mosquito service come by the next day and spray. And I just thought, well, there go your that will kill many, many insects besides mosquitoes. So we encourage you not to use any kind of insecticides. Um, you may have been hearing for the last almost 20 years now about the crisis in the bee population. And just this week, I read that it, it was it is worse this year than normal. They're losing about 50% of the honeybee population. So it's a big problem and we need to do what we can. And this is just a little cartoon to kind of get us started. So just read it on your own. And let's hope that we don't have to resort to pollinator drones. <laughs> And one way we can do that is by attracting pollinators to our yards to keep the population high. So as I mentioned, bees are the number one pollinator and there are at least 20,000 species of bees across the world. They are keystone species. And that means that if you start noticing there are no bees, that means there's a problem because we need the bees. And if our air pollution, if we have too many pesticides, if it's too dry, a lot of things can affect that. But we want to be seeing bees and the other pollinators. That's a, a sign that our area is in good health ecologically. And bees are the insect that moves pollen from one flower to another to help plants reproduce. Butterflies and hummingbirds and many, many 200,000 other kinds of animals, including humans, do that also. So the most common bee that people are aware of is the European honeybees. And those were imported to our country back in 1607 with those colonists that came from England to Virginia. And they brought the honeybees with them. And honey, European honeybees now populate the entire world. And they are very instrumental in the um, pollination of our crops. So bees live to be about six weeks. They live about six weeks. So in the um, third week of their life is when they are most active collecting pollen. 
And here we have bees collecting pollen from a datura plant. And note these big yellow, well, whitish blobs on their legs. Those are the pollen baskets. Bees, most bees carry pollen on their hind legs. They have three sets of legs. They use their first set to gather the pollen. The second set they balance with, and the third set is where they stash that pollen to take back to the hive where other bees will unpack them and feed this to the young. So pollen contains the sperm of the plant and it's the only proteins bees consume. It's best if they can get them from a variety of plants, but about 30% of bees worldwide, and this isn't just honey bees, all kinds of bees are specialists. So they only go to one kind of plant or one group, one family of plants. And pollen becomes the food for the baby bees. It's, it's bee bread. Then in the fourth through sixth weeks of a bee's life, they collect nectar. And nectar is a sweet liquid rich in vitamins, salts, oils, and other nutrients. So a lot of insects only drink nectar. Butterflies live on it. It provides the energy and the calories that bees and all insects and people even um, need to do their daily chores and to live life. Uh, bees use it to make honey. As I mentioned, butterflies live on it and it consumes half the, the diet of hummingbirds. The other half of the hummingbird diet is insects. Nectar is produced by some flowers, but not all flowers. And just by some species of flowers, just never have nectar. But it can be affected by the temperature, the soil moisture, and the plant age. So one thing, I am a very low water user and my gardens are all um, drought tolerant and I'm very skimpy with my water, usually only actually water every six to eight weeks if we don't have rain. But I noticed that then I lose some of my pollinators and it's probably because my soil isn't moisture, moist enough. So there's not enough moisture to produce the nectar. So I've, I've started trying to force myself to change my habit and water a little more often, you know, maybe every four weeks in the absence of rain. So in your garden to have pollinator plants, most of them thrive in the sunshine. There are pollinator plants that live in shade, but most of them are sun loving plants. You wanna have multiples of the same plant close together. You know, it's sort of like when you go to the grocery store and say you like one particular flavor of yogurt. Well, there's that whole big section of yogurt and you've got to pick out the one you like. And the more of it there is, the more likely you are to find it. So it's the same with these pollinators. If you have multiple plants, they're more likely to find the one they'll like. Um, you want to have blooms in every season and um, winter through winter, you know, all year round if you can. Bees are not very active in the cooler months, but we know that we have lots of warm days in the winter and the bees will be out looking for food. So you want to provide some for them. Um, the most productive flowers for producing nectar and pollen are your old and native plants. If a plant has a trademark name on it or a copyright symbol, that means it is a hybrid plant that humans created to accentuate certain 
characteristics of the plant that humans like to have in their plants. Those plants probably do not offer nectar and pollen because they don't have to lure pollinators because they do not reproduce through seeds. They are clones. So they are not very good for the pollinators. And you want a variety of colors and sizes because one size doesn't fit all. And you want your flowers to have, to offer easy access to pollinators. Here on the left is a poppy and you can see it's gathering pollen and it's very easy for it to get to that pollen because the flower is very open. On the right, we've got probably carnations or chrysanthemums, and you can't see the sex organs of the plants. So that means neither can the pollinators. So that it's much more difficult for them to get anything they want from these flowers. And I know in the fall, the arboretum is beautiful. It's got all these chrysanthemums, but if you look around, you're not seeing any bees because they're not finding what they need from those flowers. So we're gonna go through um, plants by the season and we're starting in the winter. And these are not the only plants that will attract pollinators. This is just some of the plants. And, you know, there aren't very many plants that bloom in the winter. So rosemary is one of them. That used to be a very popular plant here, but it was mostly killed off during the um, big ice storm two years, two years ago. So it's not as common as it used to be, but it is a good plant for the pollinators because when those flowers bloom, when there's a nice day, a warm day, they will come out and get um, food from that rosemary. And the nectar makes great honey. And of course, rosemary is a plant you can use in your kitchen as well. It's a very good herb. Um, camellias are another good winter bloomer. Um, here on this flower, this has just opened. And you can see down in the middle of the flower, that little black triangle, that's the head of a bee that is down there gathering pollen. This one in the middle, you can see its pollen baskets are pretty full. She is exiting the flower. She's already gotten the pollen and the one on the edge up there in about the 10 o'clock position, she's gonna be the next bee in. Only one bee can fit in at a time right now. And the bees know when a flower is going to open. And there was a lot of bees swarming around this one flower waiting to get into it. Another winter, um, very early spring bloomer is hellebores. And it offers nectar and pollen. So you want to get the old style varieties, not the hybrids. Um, lots of people use lots of weed killer on their lawn. And that's for aesthetic purposes and they think it makes it look nicer. In reality, a better thing to do would be to let some of those weeds grow and create a bee lawn. And here we've got henbit is this little lavender flower. All right, it's very prolific in the very early spring when the grasses are first coming back to life. But I have to admit, I had to walk over a block from my house before I found a lawn that had any in it. I don't have any grass at my house. So I let the hen bit grow when it crops up in my flower beds because it's a cool weather grower and it's gonna die anyway. But it does offer food for the pollinators during the cooler months. So it's good to let it grow. And here's henbit close up with a bee. So don't feel the need to kill everything that's not grass in your lawn. Personally, I would say kill your lawn, but that's not everybody's preference. 
Another thing that's great for the pollinators is dandelions. And it's also a superfood for humans. And when those colonists came to Jamestown in 1607 and brought their honeybees, they also brought dandelions because they knew that was such a valuable food, both for the bees and for themselves. So it's only in the US that dandelions are not a beloved plant. They're treasured in Europe where they originated. Um, a good spring bloomer is tall verbena. It comes out early in the spring and you'll see a lot of bees and butterflies on it because it blooms at a time when there aren't many other flowers. Um, it's got great nectar. And like I say, you'll see bees and butterflies on it. And it's, it's a very pretty plant. It has this big cluster of um, tiny little lavender flowers. It's a plant that doesn't take up much real estate in your garden because it's tall and thin. It doesn't have a lot of foliage, so it can come up among your other flowers. Autumn sage. I think this is one of the worst named plants because it blooms nearly all year round from early spring through fall. And it, it will have a, a big bloom period, then it might, the flowers will die off and about a month or six weeks later, it will have another big bloom. So it's not continuous, but it is throughout the whole year. It comes in many, many colors and it's a, Great replacement for things like, um, oh, now I can't remember what it is. Oh, darn. Um, sorry about that. But the thing you go to East Texas and see a lot, azaleas. Because, you know, if you grow azaleas, you know, they take a lot of soil conditioning because they want acid soil. Our soil is alkaline. They take a lot of water. Most of them bloom about two weeks and that's it. With the autumn sage, you'll get that continual bloom through the whole year. And um, so you'll have more flowers. And all the, uh, the hummingbirds, bees, butterflies, everybody loves this. Sages are one of the best families of plants that you can grow in our climate. They're mostly, they're very drought tolerant. Most of them heat tolerant. They're just made to grow here and they come in a wide variety of um, forms and sizes and colors. So they're a great plant. Lavender, that's not native to here, but it does well here if we don't get too much rain. It's a very uh, drought tolerant plant. And it's especially useful for the bees because the varroa mites don't like the scent. And varroa mites are one of the biggest killers of bees. Um, they started out being a big problem with the honeybees in their hives, but now they also are affecting the native bees. So anything that will deter varroa mites is a good thing for the po population of bees. Here's a milkweed. Um, there's a number of varieties of milkweed. This one is the green milkweed. And look at all the bees on it. Um, it has great nectar. Milkweed is also the host for the monarch butterflies and their cousins, the queen butterflies. That means those, the females will lay their eggs on milkweed. It's the only family of plants that the um, monarchs and the queens will use to lay their eggs. And it's because this plant has a toxin in it that will protect the further life cycles of those butterflies. And this milkweed attracts a huge variety of insects. So it's a very 
useful plant in anyone's garden. It's a very ecological plant, helping to feed a lot of desirable insects. Um, here's a couple more pictures of milkweed. This one on the left is the, what is commonly called butterfly weed, and it's kind of orangey usually. Um, I watched it for 45 minutes one day, and I could identify 14 different species of insects on it. I couldn't tell you what all those were, but they were visually different enough that I could tell that they were separate species. Over here on the right, we've got the green milkweed again. And this is a gray hair streak butterfly. And as you look at it on the right end, you see these two appendages that are little tails. And when this butterfly is getting nectar or just sitting still, you know, resting, it will rub its wings together to make those tails look like antenna so that the predators that are gonna eat this like birds will think that's the head, but really the head is over here on the left. So that's a very ingenious way that the hair streak butterflies protect themselves from predators. Another great sage, salvias are the Latin name for sage, is um, mealy cup. And it comes in purple or white. And it is a magnet for bumblebees and carpenter bees. And you know, those are big native bees. They're about four times the size of honeybees. Bumblebees have furry bodies, carpenter bees have smooth, often shiny or iridescent bodies. But I see them on these plants constantly. I see regular bees and butterflies as well. These are wonderful plants to grow. They're beautiful. You can keep deadheading them and they'll keep reblooming. Um, they die back with the frost. So you can cut them down practically to ground level in the winter, and then they'll come back on their own in the spring. A lot of the herbs or herbs, <coughs> both are correct ways to pronounce that. Um, when they go to, when they flower, and that's called bolting, those flowers are very good for the pollinators. So if you're growing, herbs I encourage you to let them flower out and the pollinators can um, feed on them. Again, cilantro is something that lots of people like to grow because they like to eat it. And the dried seeds are what we know as coriander. And again, this is another one that those varroa mites don't like the scent of it. So it's beneficial for the bees. Turk's cap. This, I have to admit, you know, it's sort of like with your children, you probably shouldn't have a favorite plant. This is one of my favorite. Um, it's a perennial. It gets really big. It can get up to six feet tall and wide. But it's a wonderful nectar source for hummingbirds, big butter, butterflies, and bees. Um, it can bloom in the sun or the shade. It's very drought tolerant, but it's okay if it's in wet soil. So it's very versatile. And the hummingbirds just love it. And here you see the hummingbird, the sex organs of the plant where the pollen is, is on this spike. And you can see that the forehead of this male ruby-throated hummingbird is right at the same level as that pollen. So hummingbirds are the exclusive pollinator of Turk's cap. And it looks like this hummingbird has pollen on its forehead there. So here we have a bumblebee being rear-ended by a honeybee on a Turk's cap. 
And no, they're nowhere near the sex organs. So they're not gonna help with the reproduction of this plant. They're just getting a drink. And the bumblebee has a very long proboscis, which is what it uses to drink. Think of it sort of like a straw. It's not exactly like that, but similar, something we're used to. And so it can sit on the outside of the flower and put its proboscis down to the bottom of the flower where the nectar is. The smaller bees, like this one that's rear-ending it, have to climb into the flower to get that nectar because they have a sh short proboscis. So when I got this picture, I was actually trying to get a picture of a honeybee going in or out of the flower, but I, it happened so quick I could never click in time. And I was astounded that I actually got this picture. But it's one of my favorites because it shows the difference in the size of the bumblebee to the honeybee. And bumblebees are considered to be four times more efficient pollinators. And it's because they're bigger, they have the furry bodies that will attract pollen and be then rubbed off on the next plant they go to. And they have that very long proboscis. And here you have some butterflies drinking from the Turk's cap. They have to be big butterflies like um, monarchs, three to four inch wingspans. And these butterflies whose, these are sulfurs. Another good one for the hummingbirds is flame acanthus. And it's a perennial. It offers nectar, it blooms June through October. Mine is just beginning to bloom out now and hummers love it. Bees don't usually come to it because the nectar is way down at the bottom of these trumpet shaped flowers and they can't get to the nectar. But here you see a hummingbird drinking from a flame acanthus flower. You know, hummingbirds have those long bills and their tongue is that long again. So they have access to nectar that is unavailable to other animals. Here's a datura plant. It's also called moonflower, um, jimson weed, angel trumpet, devil's trumpet. This has a lot of common names. And it's a tender perennial or a reseeding annual. Once you have it, you will probably have it repeatedly. The flowers open at dusk and the bees will stay up to get that pollen. Normally bees are in bed by dark, but they will stay out to get this pollen. And it also attracts hawk moths. It's a very interesting flower because you can actually see the petals move as it opens right about dusk. This picture was taken about four o'clock in the afternoon and these bees are trying to pry apart the petals so that one of them can get down and get the pollen before the flower actually opens. Here we've got a few minutes after the flower has opened and you can see the bees in here have just devoured the, the pollen. They've packed it into their pollen baskets. The one at the bottom is kind of picking it up off the floor of the flower. And these bees wanna get that job done and get back to the hive, get that pollen unpacked. And so everybody can go to bed. Fall aster. This blooms in October and it will be covered in bees and butterflies. It has, it's, it's a shrub, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> It 
is a shrub that will be kind of rounded and you'll have a huge mound of these lavender daisy-like flowers. You can trim it back once a month until August to keep it smaller and more compact and to create more blooms. Because each time you trim a stem, it will cause more stems to grow out of that spot and you'll have more flowers. But it's just gorgeous in the fall and very important to have pollinator plants su supplying food in the fall so all the animals can get enough to keep them a lot through the winter. Okay, sorry about this, it's not advancing. Okay. And here you can see a, a beautiful yellow uh, butterfly on the fall aster. Another great one for fall is frostweed. This one um, grows best in, a, in the shade, but it will grow in the sun. And it can get to be eight feet tall. So again, this is when you wanna cut back now, if you haven't done it already, to keep it from getting so tall so that you can observe the butterflies that are on top of it where the flowers come out usually in October. And this plant will be covered in bees and butterflies. And this is like Red Bull for butterflies. And this is a monarch here on it. And you know, the monarchs are migrating from the area around the US Canadian border all the way down to Mexico. They usually come through here in mid to late October. And they need all the food and energy they can get. And this is one of the two best plants that's recommended to grow to benefit the monarchs as they're coming through. And the reason it's called frostweed is because when it freezes, the stems break open and the sap comes out and it looks sort of like a ribbon. It can go into any kind of pattern. And that's how it got its name as frostweed. So although it dies back, the leaves will all die with the first freeze. I suggest you leave, I usually just, you know, use my hands and get rid of those dead leaves and leave the stems so that the first few times we have frost, I'll get to see this beautiful display. And then when it quits doing that, I cut it back to the ground and it will come back the next year. And it sometimes spreads around a bit. It's a great plant for the fall. Another great fall bloomer is goldenrod. Many people think this is ragweed, but ragweed is very um, allergenic and a lot of people react to it but it blooms in the spring. This is gonna bloom in the fall and it is not, it's insect pollinated, not wind pollinated. So it's not gonna cause us allergies. And this might be the last pollen and nectar available in the fall for, for all the insects. So it's a great one to grow. It is a big plant, um, it can get to be six feet tall. And it spreads, it spreads itself pretty aggressively. So if you have one, the next year you will have more. But um, it's a number one plant, different species throughout the country. And it's a, a wonderful plant for the pollinators if you have the space for it. So remember, for the gardens, we need to have sunshine multiples of the same plant close together. We wanna to have blooms in every season. We wanna use native and old species plants rather than the hybrids that are trademarked. 
And we want a variety of colors and sizes of plants. So this was a cartoon in the newspaper yesterday. I thought, how timely. And of course, I grabbed it because we don't want to have to have our pollinators chasing flower delivery trucks. We want them to come to our yards where they can find all the food they need. So be sure to plant flowering plants, not just evergreen shrubs. This is just something for you to read and um, hopefully appreciate. We all know things like this um, that are free, we tend not to value as much as things we pay for. So again, I'm a Dallas County Master Gardener, and you know we're here to help you. And you can get help from us by emailing us at this address. Uh, this concludes my program, so I'll be glad to take questions now. And I notice we've got some in the chat. Yes, we do. I can read those out to you, Janet, if you would like. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Perfect. The first question is from Helen. Hi, Helen. Is tall verbena the same as Brazilian verbena? Yes. The one I am thinking of. Okay, perfect. And then the second part of that question, is it a Texas native plant? No, it is not. Okay. But it's still beneficial to the pollinators. All right. Um, we have a question from Dal. My green, my green milkweeds bloom early spring only. Is that right? Yes. Yes, and um, then they kind of go dormant in the summer and that's normal for those plants. We want milkweed to be available to the monarchs for them to lay their eggs on in the spring. We do not want monarchs laying eggs as they are migrating. They are supposed to be in a sexual diapause. That means they don't mature sexually until spring and many people grow tropical milkweed which is not a native and now scientists are asking that if you grow that you cut it back by October 1st so it will not be available to the migrating monarchs. The native milkweed would have already um, kind of died back and then you don't see it in the winter, then it comes back in the spring. All right, next question. I have tried Turk's cap in the sun and shade and it, is, and it does not grow in my yard. Any advice? Wow, I have never heard that. <laughs> I mean, it, um, wow, I would test your soil. And you know, you can um, get soil testing done by a and m you can just google texas soil test or tamu texas a and m university soil test and it'll have all the instructions it's not expensive um you tells you how to get your samples of your soil you send it down to them and they'll give you an analysis of your soil and you'll see what the problems are because you must have a problem with your soil if you can't grow Turk's cap because it's very easy to grow. All right. The next question, um, flame acanthus are something that blooms during the high heat of deep summer. I have many of the red ones and one that is yellow. Do different color variants benefit pollinators the same as a common or normal plant? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't know the exact answer, but usually the color variations in plants do not affect its usefulness 
for the pollinators. Like Turk's cap, we usually think of it as red, but there's also pink and white versions and, and the pollinators love those as well. So I would think that with the flame macanthus, it would be the same situation and either color um, would be beneficial for the okay. hummingbird. Good to know. Um, from Rachel, can we plant any of these plants or seeds right now? Any of the ones you spoke of? Um, I don't suggest planting in this kind of heat um, mm -hmm. because the first thing that a plant has to do is grow its roots. And roots don't grow if the soil temperature is over 85. And I know last night when I went to bed at 11.30, it was 90 degrees. This morning when I got up at eight, it was 83. So I'm thinking that soil didn't cool down very much overnight. And then it's gonna be up to a hundred and something today. The soil is gonna be too hot for those roots to grow. And the hotter it is, the more water you have to give those plants. So the ideal time, to plant is in the fall. But lots of times the plants we want aren't available in the fall. So the earlier in the spring you can get them, the better. But in the retail market, they're only gonna be offering plants pretty much when they're blooming. So sometimes you can't get them early in the season. Um, some seeds could be planted now, you know, the, Plants reseed naturally, and it's whenever they produce their seeds and those seeds fall to the ground. And if there's enough moisture, then they can germinate. So um, I know there's a lot of things in my garden that are seeding now, including the milkweeds and um, some uh, wildflowers and things. So yeah, you could plant now, but Hopefully you've mulched your gardens and the seeds do better if they're actually on the ground, not on the mulch. So um, keep that in mind. Or you you know can start them in little starter kits and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't okay. put plants in the ground this time of year. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's hot for us. I can only imagine. Yeah, <laughs> aside from it's too hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, another question from Rachel. Where's the best pl place to find non-cloned seeds? Are there specific companies to look for? Um, yeah, Native American Seed is one of them. Um, it's in Junction, Texas. They have a, you know, just go to their website and um, or ask for one of their catalogs. They produce fantastic catalogs that are kind of, um, a big section of them is wonderful educational material. In addition to, you know, they're also selling their seeds and they have pages and pages of seeds, but they'll tell you what ones will grow in your area. And so it's a very useful tool for educational purposes, as well as for buying seeds. They're not the cheapest, but they are um, native seeds that will grow in Texas. Mm -hmm. I posted the link to Native American seed in the chat. Um, hey, the next question is, will goldenrod crowd out everything else? Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I have to admit, I have never grown goldenrod because I have, I don't have a, a place for that size plant. My yard at home is, um, I have a three car detached garage. So that takes up most of my backyard. And I also oversee the gardens at the bathhouse at uh, White Rock Lake. And the gardens just aren't big enough to hold a plant that size. So I can't speak from experience, but because they do spread aggressively, I would, I think they probably would Crowd out on the things. Okay. Um, Pam as, asks, I know these need full sun, but you mentioned Turk's cap and frostweed can tolerate some shade. Any others? I have lots of shade. 
Um, there are there aren't as many blooming flowers for the shade as there is for the sun, but um, columbines are a good one. They're you know spring bloomers. Um, there's some sages that are made um, that will grow in the shade. I'm not a shade expert, but um, there are a lot of plants. There aren't as many plants that will grow in the shade. And when I say full sun, I mean like six hours a day. And But I would think in a lot of the sun plants will grow in park shade. So if they would get four hours, that would probably be enough. But it is more challenging to find flowering plants for shade. Mm -hmm. The next question is an interesting one. Is there a resource you can recommend on how to remove a St. Augustine lawn and replace it with a natural one or a bee lawn, as you mentioned? Well, the bee lawn um, is just not using weed killers all the time in your, in your lawn. Um, but to get rid of a turf grass like St. Augustine or Bermuda, it's a process, it's a long process, and you can, I would go to um, AgriLife's website, anything with TAMU on it, T-A-M-U, Texas A&M University, and look for instructions. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can solarize it, which is like putting black plastic over it which is effective, but it also kills all the organisms in your soil. So you have to then, you know, re-fortify your soil because you want those living organisms. They're very important to your soil. Um, you can dig it out, which is probably something you'd want to hire done. Um, it, it's a challenge. You can cover it in cardboard and stuff, but I, it, it will work its way through. It's very hard to get rid of, of turf grass. So it's a deliberate thing. And you can, one way you can start doing it is digging it out. You know, if you have beds along your house or anywhere else in your yard, just keep enlarging those beds, you know, cutting, going and digging out the grass six inches or a foot a year and using that to get rid of grass. But one thing you want to remember is when you're adding plants anywhere, to group them by their water needs. So you don't want to put cactus in with coleus, for example. Coleus is an annual plant that makes beautiful foliage, and a lot of people like to use it. And I remember at Mockingbird Station, maybe 10 years ago, they redid the um, landscaping and they had a big bed that contained yuccas and, and the plant I just mentioned, the one, I'm sorry, I'm old and my memory is going. Um, but, and I, I was with a friend who didn't know much about gardening. I said, that garden is gonna fail. You've got, really thirsty plants and you've got plants that want dry soil. They're not going to, they can't coexist in the same bed. And sure enough, by the next year, they had taken out the coleus and they put in agaves. So they had agaves and yuccas and created a beautiful bed that was much more practical because they had the same watering needs. So that's one of the steps of of good gardening is to group your plants by watering. All right, let me see. Okay, um, Linda asks, I've never been able to successfully grow milkweed. Aphids just cover them. Heavy stream of water doesn't help. Any tips? Growing um, native milkweed is a challenge. And I have to admit, I. I hate to admit this, but it's the truth. 
that I've never successfully grown a native milkweed. I've had them at home and uh, they haven't, they take three years to be viable productive plants and I've never been successful. At my garden at the bathhouse, we've planted dozens of native milkweeds through the years that haven't grown successfully. But we have two green milkweeds that we did not plant that just the seeds blew in from the prairie and those plants are doing fantastic. But I have sympathy for others who haven't been able to grow milkweed. But I'll admit the tropical milkweed is very easy to grow. And that's why lots of people use it. But if you do plant it, be sure to cut it back to the ground by October 1st, because that plant can hold a parasite that is very unhealthy for the monarchs. And we don't want monarchs picking up that parasite, passing it on to their offspring, and, and ultimately they all die. So that's the reason we don't want people having milkweed available to the migrating monarchs in the fall. All right, let's see. I would encourage people. I mean, there's a lot of knowledgeable people that were in the audience. And so if they have better- Yeah, there's tons of great suggestions in there. In the chat. Um, I will say if anybody's interested in seeing a pollinator garden, we have one here at the Central Library downtown. Um, in July 15th, we're gonna be having our nature expo. And we're gonna be doing tours of the um, pollinator garden that's actually on the fifth floor balcony. I put the link to that event and it's gonna be a great event. We're gonna have lots of great organizations here. Um, the seed library will be there as well. We'll be giving away seeds. July 8th, we'll also be giving away seeds to start, you know, um, your own Shakespeare Elizabethan herb garden. <laughs> um, but the Central Library and the Renner Frankfurt Library both have pollinator gardens. Oh, I see one more question, Janet. Okay. This one's from Gianna. My dad was trying to be helpful and spread weed killer in my yard. How long do you think I'll have to wait for my beautiful weeds to return? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea because I've never used weed killer. Okay. They'll come back. <laughs> I would hope. I, would I mean, hope. people have yes. to keep, yeah, people keep using it all the time. So um, it might yeah, just take a while. Already, so yeah, well, they'll be back. Have to every year. So <laughs> hopefully it'll only last. Uh, no, they they come back. <laughs> they blow in. The wind brings them. The birds, are, you know. So those weeds will come back. It'll be pretty fast. That's my experience. Yeah, if you want to get um, flowers growing in your yard, stick up a couple of poles and string a wire across, and birds will come and sit on that, and they'll poop out seeds. So that's, that's a, a great good idea. way to get a lot of plants in your yard quickly if you you know have things for birds to sit on. <laughs> and that's why we always see a lot of plants along fence lines because it's the birds sit on the fence and poop out seeds. <laughs> I get red bud shoots and there's no red bud tree within sight so I know it's coming from the birds. And I always dig them out. I know someone has a tree farm, so I always dig them out when they're young and hand them over to the tree farm. <laughs> All right. Okay, Rachel, you asked what's happening July 8th. July 8th is actually gonna be um, Shakespeare's Run Day here at the library. It's gonna be part of our Summer Saturdays programming. And we are basically having an indoor mini Renaissance fair. Nice. So we'll have fencing demonstrations, mini horses, we'll have food vendors here, crafts and activities for families and kids. 
and it's going to be a really great day. Please uh, join us. And the Sea Library will be there giving away herb seeds. All yep. right. If you guys have any other questions, now's the time. Um, we're about to end for today. It was really great hanging out with everyone and learning so much. Thank you so much, um, Janet and Judy. Thank you so much, Janet and Daisy and team <laughs> and everyone who joined. Have a great week. Okay. Uh, we'll send out the recording um, once it's finished processing after the program. So um, definitely this week, probably in just like a day or two. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you again, Janet. It was very informative. You're welcome. Everybody stay safe and stay out of the heat. <laughs> yes.